The Complete Visions of and Catherine Emmerich The caravan of the kings took about a quarter of an hour to pass any given point. When it halted before Jerusalem, the star had become invisible. Consequently, the travelers were very much troubled. The kings rode upon dromedaries, and three other dromedaries were laden with the baggage. The rest of the cavalcade were mounted upon nimble animals of a yellowish color with small heads. I know not whether they were horses or asses, but they were very different in appearance from our horses. The animals upon which the nobles rode were very handsomely caparisoned and hung with golden stars and little chains. Some of the followers went to the gate of the city and returned with officers and soldiers. The arrival of the kings at that time when no feast was being celebrated, when no special commercial interest seemed to bring them, and also by that particular road, was something remarkable. They explained to the officials why they had come, and spoke of the star and the child. But their hearers were ignorant on the subject, and so the kings began again to think that they had surely erred, since they could not find one person who looked as if he knew anything connected with the redemption of the world. The people gazed at them in wonder, unable to conceive what they wanted. The kings explained that they were ready to pay for whatever they got from them, and that they wished to confer with their king. And now arose great hurrying to and fro, the travelers meantime interchanging questions and answers with the crowd gathered around them. Some had indeed heard of a child that was to be born at Bethlehem, but they were poor, ignorant people, and their words had no weight. Others laughed derisively, and the kings grew troubled and disheartened, and then they perceived by the expressions of the people that Herod knew nothing of what they sought, and that he was by no means beloved by his subjects. They became anxious as to how they should address him. They had recourse to prayer, their courage revived, and they said to one another, He who has brought us so quickly here by means of the star, will also lead us home in safety. They now led the caravan around the city and brought it in at the side nearer Mount Calvary. Not far from the fish market, they and their animals were conducted into a circular court, which was surrounded by halls and dwellings, and before whose gates guards were standing. In the middle of the court was a well, at which they watered the beasts, and all found quarters in the stalls and places under the arches. On one side of the court arose the mountain on which it lay, on the other, it was free and shaded by trees. I saw people coming with torches and examining the baggage. Herod's palace stood higher up the mountain not far from this court. I saw the road leading to it lighted up by torches and lanterns hung on poles. I saw officials going down from the palace and conducting to the Theokino, the eldest of the kings. He was received under an archway and ushered into a hall. There he made known his errand to a courtier who reported it to Herod. Herod became almost insane at the news, and gave orders for the kings to present themselves before him on the following morning. He also sent word to them to rest while he made inquiries, and he would inform them of the result. When Theokino returned, he and his two royal companions became still more uneasy, and ordered the baggage that had been unpacked to be packed again. They slept none that night. I saw some of them going around the city with guides. It seemed to me that they suspected Herod of knowing all, but of being unwilling to disclose the truth to them. They still sought the star. In Jerusalem itself all was quiet, but there was much running to and fro and questioning among the sentinels at the court. It may have been about eleven o'clock at night when Theokino was sent for by Herod. There appeared to be some kind of festivity going on for the palace was ablaze with lights, and I saw females in it. The news brought by Theokino threw Herod into the greatest terror. He dispatched servants to the temple and also into the city, and I saw priests and scribes and aged Jews going to him with rolls of writings under their arms. They wore their priestly garments, also their breastplates, and their girdles on which letters were inscribed. There were about twenty around him, expounding the writings. I saw them also mounting with him to the roof of the palace and gazing at the stars. Herod was very uneasy and perplexed. But the scribes tried to divert him by endeavoring to prove that there was nothing in the talk of the kings, that those eastern people were always superstitiously raving about the stars, and that, if there was any truth in what they said, 
surely the priests of the temple and the dwellers in the holy city would have known it long ago. Next morning at daybreak, I saw one of the courtiers going down to the caravan and bringing up all three of the kings to Herod's palace. They were ushered into an apartment around which were pots of foliage and bushes. Refreshments were spread at the entrance. But the kings declined the proffered food and remained standing until Herod entered. They approached him with an obeisance and without preamble put to him the question as to where they should find the newborn king of the Jews, for they had seen his star and they were come to do him homage. Herod was very much troubled, but he concealed his fears. Some of the scribes were still with him. He questioned the kings closely concerning the star, and told them that of Bethlehem Ephrata ran the promise. But Mensa related to him the last vision they had seen in the star, whereupon Herod's anxiety became almost too great for concealment. Mensa said that they had seen a virgin with a child lying before her. From the right side of the child issued a branch formed of light, upon which stood a tower with many gates, which tower increased in size until it became a city. The child appeared standing above it with sword and scepter, and they had seen not only themselves, but all the kings of the earth, coming to bow down before and adore that child, for its kingdom was to vanquish all other kingdoms. Herod advised them to go quietly and without delay to Bethlehem, and when they had found the child to return and inform him that he too might go and adore him. I saw the kings going down from the palace, and leaving Jerusalem at once. The day was dawning, and the lights on the way leading up to the palace were still burning. The crowd that had followed the royal caravan had passed the night in the city. Herod who, about the time of Christ's birth, had gone to his palace at Jericho, had been even before the coming of the kings very restless and uneasy. Two of his illegitimate sons had been raised by him to high positions in the temple. They were Sadducees, and by them he was kept informed of all that transpired, as well as of all who were opposed to his designs. Among these he was told of one, a man good and upright, a distinguished functionary of the temple. Herod sent him a courteous and friendly invitation to come to him in Jericho. When the good man was on his way to comply with the invitation, Herod's creatures fell upon him and murdered him in the desert making it appear as if robbers had perpetrated the awful deed. Some days later, Herod returned to Jerusalem in order to take part in the feast of the consecration of the temple. Then he thought he would, in his own way, give pleasure to the Jews and show them honor. He caused to be made a golden figure something like a lamb, though still more like a goat, for it had horns. This figure was to be erected above the gate leading from the outer court of the women into the court of sacrifice. Herod insisted upon this and, moreover, expected to be thanked for what he had done. But the priests resisted. Herod threatened them with a fine. They replied that the fine indeed they would pay, but that the figure, according to their law, they could never accept. Herod fell into a rage and ordered it to be set up secretly. Thereupon, one of the officers of the temple, fired with zeal, seized it as it was being brought in, cleft it in twain, and hurled it to the ground. This gave rise to a tumult, and Herod ordered the offender to be imprisoned. Herod was, on account of this affair, extremely displeased, and regretted having come to the feast. But his courtiers sought by all kinds of diversions to remove the impression from his mind. There was among some pious people in Judea the expectation of the near advent of the Messiah, and the circumstances attendant on the birth of Jesus had been noised abroad by the shepherds. Herod had heard all and had at Bethlehem made secret inquiries into it. His spies, however, having found only poor Joseph, and having besides orders not to attract attention, reported that it was nothing, that they had found only a poor family buried in a cave, and the whole affair not worth talking about. But now, all of a sudden, appeared the great caravan of the kings. Their questioning after the king of Judah was marked by such confidence and precision, they spoke with such certainty of the star, that Herod could scarcely hide his anxious perplexity. He hoped to learn the particulars of the affair from the kings themselves, and then take measures accordingly. But when the kings, warned by God, did not return, 
He explained their flight as a consequence of their falsehood and disappointment. They were, he thought, ashamed to come back and be looked upon as fools. He therefore caused to be proclaimed in Bethlehem, and in a general way, that the people should have nothing to do with the strangers. When he thought to make away with Jesus, he found that he was no longer in Nazareth. He caused search to be made after him for a long time. When he had to give up all hope of finding him, and his anxiety was, in consequence, so much the more increased, he took the desperate resolution to murder all the children. He was so cautious in executing his measures that he transported his troops beforehand, in order to avoid any insurrection. I saw the kings leaving Jerusalem in the same order in which they had come. They left by a gate to the south, first, Menser, the youngest, then Sir, and lastly, Theokino. They were followed by a crowd as far as a brook outside the city, and here the rabble left them and turned back home. On the opposite side of the brook, the kings halted and looked for their star. To their great joy, they saw it, and on again they went, singing sweetly. But what I wondered at was, that the star did not guide them by a direct route from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. They went more to the west and passed a little city that is well known to me. Beyond the same, I saw them halting at a beautiful place to pray. A well sprang up before them. They dismounted and dug a basin for the water, surrounding it with sand and sods. They remained here several hours and watered their beasts, for in Jerusalem, on account of their anxiety and trouble, they had had no rest. The star, which by night looked like a globe of light, now had the appearance of the moon when seen by day, but still it did not appear exactly round, but somewhat pointed. I saw that it was often hidden behind the clouds. The high road between Bethlehem and Jerusalem swarmed with people, travelers with their baggage on asses. They were, perhaps, on account of the census, returning from Bethlehem to distant homes, or going up to Jerusalem to the temple or the markets. But on the route taken by the kings, it was very quiet. Perhaps the star guided them that way, that they might escape notice, and arrive in Bethlehem in the evening. It was twilight when the caravan drew up before Bethlehem at the same gate at which Mary and Joseph had stopped. When the star had disappeared, the kings went to the house, the former abode of Joseph's parents, and in which Joseph and Mary had recently been inscribed. Here they thought they were to find the newborn king. It was a spacious mansion with numerous small buildings around it, an enclosed courtyard in front, and stretching beyond that a lawn with trees and a fountain. I saw on the lawn Roman soldiers, because of the tax offices in the house. Crowds of people thronged around the newcomers whose beasts were being watered under the trees near the fountain. The kings and their followers dismounted. The people showed them every mark of respect. They were not rude to them as they had been to Joseph. They presented green branches, and supplied them with food and drink but I could see that that was principally in consideration of the gold pieces which the kings were freely dispersing. I saw the travelers tarrying long in doubt and anxiety. At last I saw a light rising in the heavens on the opposite side of Bethlehem over the region of the crib. The light was like that of the rising moon. I saw the caravan again set out and wind around the south side of Bethlehem toward the east, thus bringing on one hand the field in which Christ's birth had been announced to the shepherds. They had to go around a ditch and some ruined walls. They had made choice of this route, because they had while in Bethlehem been directed to the valley of the shepherds as a good place for encamping. Some of the Bethlehemites followed the cavalcade, but the king said nothing to them of the object of their search. Saint Joseph appeared to know of their arrival. Whether he had learned it through someone from Jerusalem, or in vision, I know not. But I saw him during the day bringing all kinds of things from Bethlehem, fruit, honey, and vegetables. I saw him also clearing out the cave, making more room, taking away the partitions that cut off his own little sleeping place from the passage, and stowing away the wood and the cooking utensils under the shed before the door. When the caravan had filed down into the valley of the crib cave, all dismounted and began to set up their tents while the people that had crowded after them from Bethlehem returned to the city. The encampment was partly pitched when over the cave shone out the star and in it a child plainly visible. 
It stood directly above the crib, its stream of light falling straight down upon it. The kings and their followers uncovered their heads and watched it sinking lower and lower, increasing in size as it approached the earth. It looked to me as large as a sheet, I think. All were at first amazed. It was already dark. No dwelling was to be seen around. Only the hill of the crib cave, looking like a rampart on the plain. But soon their amazement turned to joy, and they sought the entrance of the cave. Mensa pushed back the door and there, in the upper end of the cave, which was resplendent with light, he beheld Mary sitting with the child, and looking just like the virgin they had so often seen in the star pictures. Menser stepped back and told his companions what he had seen, then all three entered the passage. I saw Joseph coming out to them with an old shepherd, and speaking to them in quite a friendly way. The kings told him in a few words that they had come to adore the newborn king of the Jews whose star they had seen, and bring him gifts. Joseph humbly bade them welcome, and they went back to their tents, in order to prepare themselves for the ceremony of their presentation. The old shepherd accompanied the king's servants to the little valley behind the hill, where there were sheds and shepherd's stalls, in order to care for the beasts. The caravan filled the whole of the little valley, and now I saw the kings taking down from the camels and putting on their wide, flowing mantles of yellow silk. They fastened around their girdles with little chains, bags, and golden boxes with knobs that looked to me like sugar bowls. They, along with the flowing mantles, made them look quite broad. They took also a little table with low feet that could be opened and folded at pleasure. It served as a salver. A cloth with tasseled fringe was thrown over it, and on it placed the boxes and dishes containing the gifts. Each king was accompanied by his four relatives. All followed St. Joseph with some of their servants to the shed before the entrance to the cave. Here they spread the cloth over the table and stood on it several of the boxes they had hanging at their girdles, to be presented as their gifts in common. Then two youths of Mensa's train went in at the door, laid down strips of carpet all the way up to the crib, and withdrew to a distance. And now Menser and his four companions entered, having previously laid aside their sandals. Two servants bore the table with the gifts through the passage up to the crib cave, but at the entrance, Menser took it from them, carried it in himself, and on bended knee placed it at Mary's feet. The other kings and their companions remained standing at the entrance. I saw the cave filled with supernatural light. Opposite the entrance, and on the spot where Jesus was born, was Mary leaning on one arm in a posture more reclining than sitting. By her side was Joseph, and on her right, in a raised trough with a cover thrown over it, lay the infant Jesus. At Mensa's entrance, Mary rose to a sitting posture, drew her veil around her, and took the child, which she enveloped in its folds, upon her lap but she drew the veil aside sufficiently to allow the child to be seen as far as below the little arms. She held it upright leaning against her breast, its little head supported by her hand. The infant folded its little hands upon its breast as if in prayer. It was shining with light, was very gracious, and at times extended its little hands, as if grasping something. Mensa fell on his knees before Mary, bowed his head, crossed his hands on his breast, and offered the gifts with some reverent words. Then he took from the bag at his girdle a handful of little metal bars, about a finger in length, thick and heavy. They were pointed at the upper end, granular in the middle, and shone like gold. He laid them humbly on Mary's lap by the child, as his gift to her. Mary accepted them graciously and humbly, and covered them with the end of her mantle. Mensa's companions stood behind him with heads lowly bowed, Menser gave gold, because he was full of love and confidence, and had always with unshaken devotion and untiring efforts, sought after salvation. When Menser and his companions withdrew, Sir with his four relatives entered and knelt. He carried in his hand a golden censer, in shape like a boat, filled with small, greenish grains like resin. He gave incense, for he was the one that clung to God, voluntarily, reverently, and lovingly following his will. He placed his gift upon the little table, and knelt long in adoration. After Sir came Theokino, the eldest of the kings. He could not kneel, 
because he was too old and stout. He stood bowing low, and laid upon the table a little golden ship in which was a fine green herb. It was fresh and living, stood erect like a delicate green bush, and had small white flowers. Theokino offered myrrh, for myrrh is typical of mortification and vanquished passions. This good man had had to struggle against severe temptations to idolatry and polygamy. He remained very long before the infant Jesus, so long that I felt anxious for the good people, the king's followers, who at the entrance were so patiently awaiting their turn to see the child. The words of the kings and their followers were extraordinarily simple and childlike. They were as if inebriated with love. They always began, We have seen his star and that he is king over all kings. We have come to adore him and to bring him gifts. With the tenderest tears and most fervent prayers, they commended to the child Jesus themselves, their goods, and property, all that they valued on earth. They begged him to take their hearts, their souls, their actions, their thoughts. They entreated him to enlighten them, to bestow upon them all the virtues, and to the whole earth to grant peace, happiness, and love. They were glowing with love. No words could depict their ardor and humility, nor the tears of joy that bathed their cheeks and flowed down the beard of the eldest. They were perfectly happy. They believed that, at last, they had entered into the star after which their forefathers had so long legitimately sighed, and at which they themselves had so longingly gazed. All the joy of the promise of many hundreds of years now fulfilled, welled up in their hearts. Joseph and Mary also wept. I never before had seen them so full of joy. The honor paid their child and savior, and the recognition of him by the kings, of that child for whom their poverty could afford so poor a couch, of that child the knowledge of whose high dignity lay hidden in the silent humility of their own hearts all that comforted them immeasurably. They saw brought to him from so great a distance by God's almighty power, and in spite of the machinations of man, what they themselves could not procure for him, viz., the adoration of the great, and magnificent gifts offered with holy profusion. Ah! They adored with those great ones, and the honor their child received inundated their heart with exceedingly great joy. The Mother of God accepted everything most humbly and thankfully. She spoke not, but the movement of her veiled head told all. The infant Jesus lay on her mantle and covered by her veil, through which his little form shone brightly. It was only at the close of their visit that the Blessed Virgin addressed some kind words to each, throwing her veil back a little as she spoke. The kings now returned to their tents, which were lighted up and looked very beautiful. At last, the good servants arrived at the crib. During the adoration of the kings, they had with Joseph's help erected a white tent on the hill toward the shepherd field to the left of the crib cave. They had brought with them on their beasts of burden the tent with all its covers and poles, the latter of which fitted into one another. At first I thought that Joseph had put it up, and I began to wonder where he had got it so quickly and opportunely. But when the caravan was about to leave, I saw that tent taken down and packed up with the rest. There was a kind of shed of straw matting put up in it, under which the chests were placed. After the servants had pitched the tent and arranged all things in it, they took their stand at the door of the crib cave, humbly awaiting admittance. And now they began to enter, five at a time, accompanied by one of the nobles to whom they belong. They knelt before Mary, and silently adored the child. Lastly, came the boys in their little mantles, and then there may have been in all about thirty persons present. When all had withdrawn, the kings again came in together. They had changed their mantles for others of raw silk, white and flowing, and they carried censers and incense. Two servants had previously laid down over the floor of the cave, a carpet of a deep red color, on which Mary sat with the child while the kings offered incense. This carpet Mary kept ever afterward. She walked on it, and took it with her on the ass to Jerusalem when she went there for her purification. The kings incensed the child, Mary, Joseph, and the whole cave. This was with them a ceremony expressive of veneration. I saw the kings afterward in the tent reclining on a carpet around a little low table. Joseph brought in little plates of fruit, rolls, honeycomb, and small dishes of vegetables. 
Then he sat down and ate with them. He was so delighted, and not at all shamefaced. He wept for joy almost the whole time. When I saw that, I thought of my own father, and how, at my profession in the convent, he had to sit among so many fine people. In his humility and simplicity, he had indeed felt intimidated, but it did not prevent his giving vent to his feelings in tears of joy. When Joseph returned to the crib cave, he removed all the rich gifts to a recess at the right of the crib, where he had screened a little corner from sight. Annas' maid who had remained to wait upon Mary, retired to the little cellar-like cave on the left of the crib cave, and did not come forth until all the visitors had departed. She was a quiet, modest person. I saw either Mary nor Joseph nor the maid examining the gifts or showing any worldly pleasure on their account. They were accepted with thanks, and with liberality were again distributed to the needy. That maid was a relative of Anne, and a robust and very serious person. On this evening and during the night, I saw in Bethlehem only at Joseph's paternal house a noisy bustling to and fro and, when the kings entered the city, there was some little excitement. Around the crib cave all was, at first, very quiet. After a while, I saw here and there in the distance Jews lurking and whispering together, and giving notice in the city of what they saw. I saw also in Jerusalem on this day many old Jews and priests hurrying to and fro with writings to Herod, and then all became quiet as if they wished the subject dropped. At last the kings with their people held, under the cedar over the suckling cave, a religious service. The singing was most touching, the boys' sweet voices mingling with those of the elders. After the service, the kings went with a part of their followers to a large inn at Bethlehem. The others slept in the tents between the crib and the suckling cave, which latter they had also taken possession of for the storing of part of their treasures. The white tent before the crib was occupied by some of the most distinguished of the nobles. On the next day, the kings again visited the crib cave separately. During the whole day, I saw much given away by them, especially to the shepherds out in the field where the beasts had been sheltered. I saw poor old women bent with age going around with mantles over their shoulders given them by the king's generosity. I saw crowds of Jews from Bethlehem thronging around the good people, trying by every means in their power to extort presents from them, and looking through all that they had with a design to cheat. I saw the kings freeing several of their people who wanted to remain among the shepherds. They gave them some of the beasts of burden with all kinds of covers and vessels packed on them, also golden grains, or gold dust, and they parted from them most cordially. I know not why their number was so diminished. Perhaps many went away, or were sent home the preceding night. There was also a quantity of bread given away. I do not know where they got so much but true it is that they had it. They were accustomed to bake wherever they encamped. I think they must already have received a warning to diminish their luggage as much as possible on their return journey. That evening I saw the kings in the crib cave, taking leave. Mensa entered first alone, and the Blessed Virgin gave him the child in his arms. He shed abundant tears, and his face was beaming with joy. Then followed the others and took leave with many tears. They again offered numerous gifts, a great roll of precious stuff, pieces of silk, some whitish, others red, also flowered stuffs, and many very fine covers. They left their large mantles also with the holy family. They were fine wool of a pale delicate color, and so light that they floated on the breeze. They brought also numerous dishes piled one above the other, boxes of grain, and a basket full of pots containing delicate green plants bearing tiny leaves and white blossoms. About three of these small pots stood in the middle of a larger one. Still another could have found room between them and the rim of the large pot. They were arranged in the basket, one above the other. There were also long, narrow baskets containing birds, such as I had seen hanging on the dromedaries, and which they used for food. They all wept much when parting from the child and Mary. I saw the Blessed Virgin standing by them when they took their leave. The king's gifts were received by Mary and Joseph with touching humility and sincere thanks to the donors, but without any manifestations of pleasure. During the whole of this wonderful visit, 
I never saw in Mary the least shadow of self-interest. In her love for the child Jesus and compassion for St. Joseph, she thought that the possession of these treasures would, perhaps, prevent their being treated in Bethlehem with such contempt as had been shown them upon their arrival. For Joseph's trouble and mortification on that account had been to her a source of suffering. Lamps were already lighted in the crib cave, when the kings took leave. They went out behind the hill toward the east, to the field in which were their people and beasts. In it stood a high tree whose spreading boughs shaded a wide circumference. The tree was very old and had a legend of its own, for Abraham and Melchizedek had met under its branches. The shepherds and the people around regarded it as sacred. A spring gushed up before it, the waters of which the shepherds used at certain seasons on account of their healing qualities. There was near the tree a furnace which could be covered, and at both sides huts affording shelter at night. A hedge surrounded the whole tract. Thither went the kings, and found all the followers still remaining to them gathered together. A light was suspended from the tree, and under it they prayed, and sang with indescribable sweetness. Joseph entertained the kings again in the tent by the crib, and then they and their nobles returned to their inn at Bethlehem. Meanwhile, the governor of the city, acting on a secret order from Herod or moved by a spirit of officiousness, I know not, had resolved to arrest the kings then in Bethlehem, and accuse them to Herod as disturbers of the peace. I know not when he was going to execute his resolve, but to the kings that night in Bethlehem and to their followers in their tents near the crib, an angel appeared in sleep, warning them to depart forthwith and to hasten home by another way. Those in the tents immediately awakened Joseph, and told him the order just received. While they proceeded to arouse the whole encampment, and order the tents to be taken down, which was done with incredible speed, Joseph hurried off to Bethlehem to announce it to the kings. But they, leaving most of their baggage behind them, had already started from the city. Joseph met them on the way and told them his errand. They informed him that they, too, had received similar instructions from an angel. Their hurried departure was unnoticed in Bethlehem. Issuing forth quietly and without their baggage, an observer might have concluded that they were going to their people, perhaps for prayer. While they were still in the cave, weeping and taking leave, their followers were already starting in separate bands in order to be able to travel more quickly, and were hurrying to the south, by a route different from that by which they had come, through the desert of Engadi along the Dead Sea. The kings implored the Holy Family to flee with them. On their refusal, they begged Mary at least to conceal herself with Jesus in the suckling cave, that she might not on their account be molested. They left many things to St. Joseph to give away. The Blessed Virgin, taking the veil from her head, bestowed it upon them. She had been accustomed to envelope the infant Jesus in its folds when holding him in her arms. The kings still held the child in their arms. They were shedding tears and uttering most touching words. At last they gave their light silk mantles to Mary, mounted their dromedaries, and hurried away. I saw the angel by them in the field, pointing out the way they should take. The caravan was now much smaller, and the beasts but lightly burdened. Each king rode at about a quarter of an hour's distance from the others. They seemed to have vanished all on a sudden. They met again in a little city, and then rode forward less rapidly than they had done on leaving Bethlehem. I always saw the angel going on before them, and sometimes speaking with them. Mary, wrapping the child Jesus in her mantle, at once withdrew to the suckling cave. The gifts of the kings and all that they had left were also taken thither by the shepherds who had tarried around the encampment in the valley. The king's people who had preferred to remain behind their masters lent a helping hand. The three oldest of the shepherds, who had been the first to do homage to Jesus, received very rich presents from the kings. When it was discovered in Bethlehem that the caravan had departed, the travelers were already near Engadi, and the valley in which they had encamped was, with the exception of some tent poles left standing and the footprints in the grass, lonely and still as before. The appearance of the royal caravan had caused great excitement in Bethlehem. Many now regretted that they had refused lodgings to Joseph. Some spoke of the kings and their followers as of a swarm of adventurers, 
while others connected their advent with the accounts they had heard of the wonderful apparitions to the shepherds. I saw from the city hall a proclamation made to the assembled citizens, viz., that they should beware of all preposterous opinions and superstitious reports, and go no more to the abode of those people outside the city. When the crowd had dispersed, I saw Joseph at two different times conducted to the city hall. The second time, he took with him some of the gifts of the kings, which he presented to the old Jews who had taken him to task, and he was set at liberty. There was another way leading from the city to the neighborhood of the crib cave, not by the city gate, but from that place where Mary, on the evening of her arrival with Joseph in Bethlehem, had rested under the tree while waiting for Joseph to find a lodging. This point of egress I saw the Jews blocking up with a fallen tree. They also erected a watch house with a bell from which was a rope stretched across the road. Thus anyone trying to go that way would soon be discovered. I saw also about sixteen soldiers with Joseph at the crib cave. But when they found besides himself only Mary and the child, they returned to the city to report. Joseph had carefully concealed the royal gifts. There were other caves in the hill under that of the crib. No one knew of them but Joseph, who had discovered them long ago in his boyhood. They had existed from the time of Jacob who, when Bethlehem counted only a couple of huts, had there a tent with his followers. The gifts of the kings, the woven stuffs, the mantles, the golden vessels all after the resurrection were consecrated to religious uses. Each king had three light mantles and one, thick and heavy, for bad weather. The thin ones were of very fine wool, yellow and red mixed, and so light that they floated on the breeze as the wearers moved along. On festive occasions, they were exchanged for mantles of silk. They were not dyed, but of the original, lustrous shade. The train was embroidered around the edge with gold, and it was so long that it had to be carried. I had also a vision of the raising of silkworms. In a region between the country of Sir and Theokino, I saw trees full of silkworms. Every tree was surrounded by a little ditch of water, in order to prevent the worms from crawling away. Fodder was scattered under the trees, and from their branches hung little boxes. Out of these boxes the weavers took chrysalides, about a finger in length, from which they wound off a web like that of a spider. They fastened a number of these chrysalides before the breast, and spun from them a fine thread which they rolled on a piece of wood provided with a hook. I saw the silk weavers among the trees at their looms, which were very simple. The strips of stuff woven were as wide, perhaps, as my bed. Let's pray, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen.